Okay, good morning, Caroline. How are you today? I'm great. The sun is shining. I am up in Elgin. Um, uh, I'm up in Dr. Gray's and uh, the weather is beautiful. So, uh, yeah, looking forward. I've got a few visits to do today, so um, looking forward to getting that done. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so uh, I believe you've got uh, a number of updates um, f for us today, Caroline, before we start with uh, this month's questions. I have, I have. And um, so I'll try and be really succinct and hopefully folks will remember the questions. But if you can't, um, uh, then then you'll get the gist. So um, electrical vehicle salary sac sacrifice uh, suggestion question that came in at the beginning of the year. Um, and uh, Tom Power, our Director of People and Culture, and the team have been working on the suggestion, which is great news. Um, so they've been exploring green vehicle options um, around that. So although they're at the early stages of it, I think there's a positive um, uh, or, or very hopeful way forward. And the team have been in active discussions with a number of organisations and companies, not just about electrical vehicles, but about a range of different salary sacri sacrifice schemes. So, so um, quite exciting and uh, all aligned to our work around being an employer of choice and, and how can we maximise opportunities for our colleagues. So in terms of timescales, I am hoping that there will be an updated position going to the Grampian Area Partnership Forum in August, which obviously you jointly chair with Adam. Um, so that's the time frame. So um, still a few uh, I's to dot and T's to cross, but the vibes that I'm getting are positive. So that's good. Even more positive, um, I think we have agreed a way forward to test what our drinking water options would be. So I'm absolutely delighted and hugely grateful to um, colleagues in facilities and estates for progressing this because I know this feels as if it has been a, a, a long journey. It's felt like that for me trying to find a way forward with it, let alone for colleagues that have been writing to me and um, putting questions forward. So um, this is all around the temperature of the water and the taste of the water. And although that being safe to drink, actually, um, is it palatable and are the alternatives to that appropriate or, or um, efficient for us? So um, we've been working with the team to understand that what, what we could do. And this is a test of change that we're going to um, uh, put in place. So um, I'm just going to make sure I'm reading this so I don't misrepresent it. So what we are doing is um, we've taken a kind of mapping of all the areas that have raised concerns around this and agreed on, um, now I'm reading three, uh, so maybe it's three plumbed in water coolers, um, two on the ARI site and one in Fraserburgh Hospital. The ARI site locations have been um, the kind of areas that have raised most concern around this. Um, the trial is going to monitor the water coolers. It's going to see how much they're used. It's going to see if that addresses the, the issues that have been raised by colleagues. And um, really importantly, to make sure that we are assured there is no additional infection prevention control risk. And the aim would have to be to have these in situ within the next four weeks. Um, uh, and, and then we'll be really explicit about where the location is in the daily brief. So where are we? The 16th of June. So by the 16th of August, um, uh, uh, these will be in place. So that is fabulous news. Um, moving on, staff gyms. So colleagues that are regular watchers of this will know the number of questions that I have been asked around um, staff gyms. And unfortunately, the answer to this is not going to be what colleagues, um, I think, uh, will, um, particular colleagues that have been raising concerns will want to hear. However, I will caveat that with one of the reasons we're doing these q and is to stop kicking the difficult decisions into the long grass and to be really honest with what we can and what we can't achieve. And that's going to sometimes be good news, like the last two, and sometimes it's not going to be. So having had colleagues around this now for about 18 months trying to understand what is the way forward, the agreed position is that um, 
the the team that have been around this in Leeds, so it's, it's over the the sports committee um, is is the group that have been looking at it, is that their overall aim is to maximise equity of access um, for all staff across Grampian, not just colleagues who had access to particular facilities on particular sites. So what they are working on is a range of physical and well-being activities that are accessible for everyone, and therefore I am going to say. Although the, the, the brief that I got is it's extremely unlikely, I'm going to say we're not going to open any of the gyms on sites. Um, there is not a way that we can find to do that with equitable access and um, in an affordable way. So recognise that will disappoint a lot of colleagues, um, but the opportunity exists for um, uh, colleagues that have a, a specific interest in the health and well-being and physical health and well-being components to join the working group to make sure that the options that we agree um, are the best they can be. So um, if you just, now I don't have an email address to go to for that, but um, what we'll do is I'll ask Mike to put that, Stephen, in, in the brief so that folk know where to go with that. Um, payroll for retirees was a question I was asked and I have been confirmed the timeline around that is two months um, is the maximum that people should be waiting uh, to to have that information. Um, and then the other question that I've got the final update on was around the question that was raised around um, the fairness of um, leave uh, with COVID with, in relation to COVID from bank colleagues and non-bank colleagues. So last time we were asked about the fairness of the difference in special leave. So I've discussed this with HR and um, I have absolutely clarified there is no difference whatsoever. Um, so if you're experiencing that, then, then there's clearly a technical understanding issue that we need to work through, but there are no differences um, there are specific criteria for managers to follow for recording purposes. However, it's it's the, the, the outcome um, is the same. And the link to the COVID Q&A um, uh, will, will be put in the brief around this, this um, and we'll have this detail around the, the COVID leave issues if people want to understand that in more detail. I think that's it, Stephen. Um, so we'll move on to the questions. Yep, great. Yep, that, thank you for all the updates, and uh, hopefully that you know, gives some reassurance to our uh, your know, monthly audience that that actually questions aren't just being asked and then you know not not being answered. So uh, I think that's you know only a good thing, even if even if sometimes the answers aren't perhaps what um, some people would like them to be. So uh, on to this month's questions then. Uh, so um, first of all, we've got an anonymous. Um, question from a payroll colleague. Uh, as an organisation, NHS Grampian have a vision and value of caring, listening and improving. Why is it okay for employees and departments to contact payroll and show no respect for their colleagues when often the mistake or reason for the employee's anger is not caused by payroll? Too often colleagues feel it is okay to speak to colleagues in an aggressive and rude manner, often using language and a tone of voice that if used in a ward would result in a formal complaint. The, colleague, uh, the anonymous colleague then goes on to ask whether people should uh, have direct phone numbers, emails and contact names to specific peer, payroll uh, people uh, on their payslips as they feel it encourages people to skip talking to the line manager or checking the relevant sections on the internet first. Thanks, Stephen. So um, thank you. Anonymous colleague, wasn't it? Um, so thank you for, for raising that. And I'll start off with by, by, I presume that is a rhetorical question. So it is absolutely not acceptable for any member of um, the Grampian team, so any Grampian colleague, to be in the receiving end of any physical or verbal aggression. And um, of course, I would include payroll colleagues in that. So I'll start off by saying, we have a zero tolerance. We have a zero tolerance for a reason. And um, that is about every colleague uh, in, in the system. So it's not acceptable. I will then go on to, to just touch on um, the, the point about so, so the direct access thing. So I actually think I think direct access is good um, and, and, and it should be used appropriately. So there's maybe an information sharing issue or an understanding issue that we need to find a different way to communicate. Um, but I think trying to deal with how people choose to behave by not giving access would not be the right way forward. 
we need to create the conditions in this organisation where when people are on the receiving end of aggressive um, uh, dialogue, conversation, call it aggression, let's just say aggression, um, we need to feel safe as individuals to say this is unacceptable um, and, and how to stop that. So there's skills in how you do that well. Um, and so there's perhaps um, something we need to do about education. There's something we need to do about continued messaging and humanising of everybody in the system. And, and and it's much easier to behave in a particular way, doesn't make it acceptable, but much easier to behave in a particular way if if that system or that part of the system is faceless, I think, or 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 you don't you don't understand the dynamics that are behind that. So the mo- so the work that they're doing in facilities in the states actually on social media to raise the profile and the importance of is it okay to to shout at a parking attendant? Absolutely not. Is it okay to 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 um uh, to so it's not okay to do that for anyone. So raising the impact and sharing the impact and consequence of that with others, I think, is really important. So not acceptable. Understand that issues relating to money are are highly sensitive and highly distressing for people. Still doesn't excuse any bad behaviour around that. And um, how you de- de-escalate that, um, I actually genuinely don't know what skills non-clinical colleagues are given in in de-escalation techniques I, I don't know that so that's maybe something Stephen you and I need to find out together um because that is something that we use recognizing that when people can be very distressed and um, then that's sometimes what happens so let's work out um if there's anything more we can do in particular payroll colleagues have raised this so with the de-escalation um, education and and the kind of narrative around talking that down and ending a call if somebody won't behave appropriately the, i've said i don't think the issue of um, not giving the number is the right thing that's an educational thing and um, a huge thank you again to payroll colleagues for the work that they do yeah thanks thanks caroline um, okay, next question is from uh, Abigail Wright, who is an FY1, uh, and Abigail asks, what is NHS Grampian's response to the recent Me Too joint investigation published by the British Medical Journal and The Guardian? Uh, that investigation found that the NHS, the NHS Trust in England recorded more than 35,000 cases of rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, stalking and abusive remarks between 2017 and 2022. Uh, and Abigail goes on, does NHS Grampian keep records specifically about sexual assault with uh, within healthcare facilities? Are they willing to publish these? And what is NHS Grampian's policy regarding sexual assault? Uh, Abigail was deeply troubled by the recent article in the BMJ and is hoping the NHS Grampian are, active, are acting proactively in light of this investigation. Yeah, um, Abigail, thanks for raising that and what a distressing report. Um, uh, so um, this the question of reporting um, uh, sexual um, uh, misconduct and sexual harassment or violence was raised, if not in the last CUNY, but in the one before that about opportunities for reporting. And um, we have taken that through our equalities group. And we've also um, had a discussion with um, health and safety and how, because that's the banner that violence and aggression would come under and, and how we are reporting on that. Um, so so the recording of it and, and the, the options um, for colleagues, because not everybody wants to put it on Datex, how do we categorise it? And therefore, how could we identify the data to understand the scale of the problem? Um, so I believe that um, we we are recording incidences of sexual assault and harassment, and it is one of the categories in Datex. But what I also know is that that is not capturing the totality of it because of reporting preference and how safe people feel. So what I'm going to do is is keep this on the radar of health and safety and the equalities group until we come up with a, an understanding of how do we know our data is as robust as it can be? And notwithstanding that and not waiting on that, because we know it exists, so let's not pretend it doesn't, 
um, making sure that we have all the right resources around addressing issues when we know they are there. So um, I don't have a complete answer for that just now, Abigail, but um, uh, uh, that, that's to let you know it is on, it is on the important um, kind of list from, our, our, from everyone. Um, but it's, uh, from partnership and, and HR uh, and health and safety are specifically um, looking for that. From the last QA, um, uh, one of the other things that we explored was an anonymous way of reporting. And I believe that that um, document is being in its final stages and, and will be getting uh, shared through the daily brief. So, uh, so, so if you look out for that, um, thanks for raising the question, uh, distressing and. Um, a, a, a report to read and yeah, for anybody that is experiencing that or observes that um, please know you will have our full support to call it out yeah, Thanks, thanks Carly Okay, uh, next question is from Fiona Harris who is a GP practice manager um, Fiona sees that NHS Grampian's COVID guidance page has not been updated since the 14th of December 2022 uh, please, can we have up-to-date guidance for healthcare staff to follow if they have symptoms of respiratory infections, i.e., you know, now that the World Health Organization ended the global emergency status for COVID-19 in May and the requirement to wear masks has been removed, should COVID be treated uh, like any other respiratory infection with no COVID testing and just stay at home if too ill to come to work? Thanks, Fiona. So, so this is a little cheaty one because, um, as you know, Mike um, it helps Stephen and I with this, and Mike sits in the corporate comms um, team, and therefore, when he got this, as you would expect, um, they immediately went to think, "What, what, what what's behind it?" So, you're right, Fiona. Um, uh, the team have looked at it, and the page that you mentioned was out of date, so it was taken down straight away. Um, it was a complete oversight, and, and the team have said they're sorry. Um, and what they're doing they're, again in this in this Q and A, um, whilst the, the page is being updated in this Q and A, um, then they'll put a link to uh, to to the, the COVID information, um, and uh, and that will be that will be with this video. So um, thanks for letting us know, um, and the team have addressed that with immediate effect. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you uh, to Mike and colleagues in Corporate Comms. Uh, next question is from Emma Ray from Learning and Development. And Emma writes, I hope you were able to enjoy some lovely weather uh, recently, which is partly the reason why I'm emailing this question. This is both a question and also a concern for the health and well-being of patients, staff, visitors uh, to our NHS campaign sites. Since the introduction of the Scottish legislation, which made smoking on NHS sites a finable offence, have council enforcement officers actually patrolled or visited our sites? Also, what work is being done to ensure our sites are smoke-free? Emma then goes on to mention the smoking-related litter, its environmental impact and the dangers of second-hand smoke. Thanks. So, firstly, I am indeed enjoying the weather and thank you for asking. It's great. Uh, sunshine makes such a difference. Um, the, the question that you raise, Emma, I don't know the answer um, and I'm just going to be really short and say that. So what I'm going to do is absolutely get the facts around your first question in relation to um, the role of, of um, uh, 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 councils and, and how we have been managing that um, uh, to, to actually know what, what has taken place and, and indeed what has the outcome of that been. And um, then the broader work that goes on and continues to go on around smoking um, uh, we're happy to put an update in the brief around that. Uh, I, I don't think anybody um, underestimates the challenge, not, not for colleagues, of course, um, because colleagues absolutely know um, uh, uh, the, the legislation and as an employee, the expectations. I think what the, the issue that definitely arises around patients and families and how you manage that in the most um, beneficial way for everyone. So um, I'll get I, all I can say is let's get an update on on anything new around that, and uh, specifically on the first part of your question. But thanks for raising it. Thanks, Caroline. Okay, next question is from an anonymous colleague. Uh, does NHS Grampian have a pensions advisor or a pensions officer that an individual employee can meet to discuss the practicalities of retiring from the NHS? 
for example, helping us to understand what our choices are and support filling in paperwork, etc. I'm aware that there are workshops available, but they do not address individual situations. I've looked on the internet, but cannot find such a person. So I feel your pain, and I've said before on this um, uh, this Q and A session, pensions are really complex, and 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 I understand that. Um, however, so we don't have a pensions advisor, and and that is because we can't. So as an employer, we we are unfortunately unable um, to provide advice on on on. On such schemes, um, and 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 that's for a number of conflicts of interest. So 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 we can't. Um, however, what we've tried really really hard to do is to make advice and signposting to people that can provide financial advice um, uh, accessible for for everyone. And and these services are free. A number of them are. You can of course pay, um, but but a number of them are free sources of advice. Um, and the SPPA's website, I know it's difficult sometimes, but actually if you can take the time to try and go through it, that that can help. So um, my suggestion is if you are really struggling um, then um, to, to navigate that and you've spoken to kind of colleagues around it, then um, if you contact the HR hub, they might just help direct you to the free sources so that just help you navigate the signposting that we've put in place if you're struggling with that. Um, but unfortunately, as much as I would love that we could all have a pensions advisor that was accessible um, uh, for us, uh, it, it would not be just or appropriate. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Caroline. I, I'm I'm very aware of these sorts of questions because certainly uh, members of the various trade unions, professional organisations, quite often contact those organisations looking for pensions advice. And yeah, it's it, the same regulations that are restricting what NHS Grampian can do uh, absolutely apply to to the staff side organisations as well. Unless you're an independent financial advisor, you're not allowed to give. You know, and for you know, for very sensible reasons, you're not allowed to give sort of pensions advice. So um, yeah, but. Hopefully, and it's really hard. Answer. Sometimes you feel as if you just nobody will tell you. So nobody's going to make the decision for you. But but even knowing the right questions to ask, I think sometimes feels hard. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, next question is from David Caney, uh, who is a community mental health nurse uh, based in Brewery. And David writes: uh, the Aberdeenshire Health and Social Care Partnership has been on the go for seven years, and yet I still can't access their IT systems, e.g. Uh, care first, and neither can they access ours, e.g. Um, Sky and Track Care. Uh, this also applies to the online systems for staffing. Do you think the NHS social care systems will ever join up properly? <laughs> the million dollar question. So, um, David, thanks for raising the question. It's something that we we are very well aware of um, uh, and recognise I don't have to deal with that every single day. So the frustration that you feel um, will be will be much more. And it's it's not just about it's about systems across the whole um, the 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 the, um, the whole patch that don't speak to each other. So the overall aim is absolutely to get IT systems and information governance rules that will allow the safe and effective transfer of of data to allow you to do your job. Um, uh, with minimal disruption uh, and we're not there yet and I absolutely can see why why that question would be raised so um, there are multiple factors that are around this I can try and get a bit of a brief from Neil um, Gordon who's heading up um, eHealth at the moment um, just to see where we're at but it is a constant piece of work if you imagine the number of digital systems that we have but specifically for the systems that you've raised Neil might be able to give us a bit of a position on that and we can just come back directly to you. Okay thank you and um, next question I think is anonymous um, so will pool cars be returning to Aberdeen? It can be quite challenging from working across sites, particularly uh, between ARI and Dr Gray's, to get suitable transport options, and for us, the pool cars were always a good solution. Train times do not always fit, and car hire drop-off pickup times are not always reliable, so you need uh, careful planning. As registered car users, the cut-off for a journey is 100 miles. Unfortunately, the return to Elgin 
Ballardine exceeds this, if pool cars cannot be reinstated, could the 100 mile limit be revised, at least for journeys to and from Elgin? Hmm. So I don't know. Um, and what I do know is being able to get to your work with, with minimal hassle is really important. Um, so I'm going to have to ask Chantel to, to, to give us a, an update on that. I, I don't know the answer to that. So let's get that. We might be able to get it before this is published, but if not, we can get it. Um, uh, or I can follow up in the next q and like I did at the beginning. Okay. Thanks, Caroline. Um, next one is from an anonymous member of admin staff at Dr. Gray's uh, who asks, Hi, Caroline. Uh, thank you for providing people with this opportunity to ask questions. Can you shed any light on what happened to the culture survey? I realise nurses and some others were surveyed, but it was suggested it would be carried out with all other staff at some point. So you're absolutely right. So um, uh, we can not provide a bespoke update on what happened to to the work that we did but we can put a link or something I'm sure in 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 relation to um what's happened with that so there's a huge amount of work has happened for the teams that um undertook those um uh, uh, those surveys and the, the the data and understanding of how our how you experience um work has been has been um moved forward hugely and teams are doing individual things departments are doing things so there's a whole heap of stuff um that we can that we can share and actually if you're based up in dr grey's um having a conversation with the chief nurse fiona robertson and um, she'd be able to tell you what's going on specifically in the grey's site i'm sure other nurses would too but that's just fiona's name comes into my my head um as far as I made an absolute commitment on this Q and A that we would do phase two of the BPA survey this year, and um, Tom and uh, colleagues that are around the culture work. So Tom's director of people and culture, and the colleagues that are around that work are looking to understand um, the practicalities of doing that. So there's a few practicalities. There's the cost. Um, there's then. For the first phase of the survey, we had to do it on paper because we couldn't get the information governance work sorted. Um, so that that we can't do that with 17,000 colleagues. So there's a number of practicalities being worked through. Um, and uh, uh, I am looking for an update over the summer. I know Tom's got all the information, so I'm looking for an update on that and then to be able to share with you and colleagues. But you have my personal assurance that the importance of culture is not just for those that have done the survey the learning actually from the information that that told us could be applied to any colleague in any group um so so i think um we're not waiting to do that survey to to uh, progress work and if you've got a specific interest then speak to your line manager speak to um, colleagues in greys and see how you can get involved don't hang back you don't need to wait for the survey but at end of summer um early autumn uh, tom or i will come out with a formal position on the next phase okay thank you oh, tom's listening to this tom that's the timeline <laughs> um Okay, so the next question is from anonymous, an, an anonymous GP um, practice manager. Um, uh, the colleague says they're happy to speak to Caroline about this, but just was, doesn't want to use their name on video. Uh, it's a longer uh, question, uh, but since it's an important topic to a lot of people, uh, we wanted to read it out in full. Uh, so uh, the colleague was listening to your answer, uh, I think last month, relating to primary care nursing staff's question around the agenda for change pay scale the NHS staff had been awarded. Your answer to this was fair, however it then got me thinking. I'm a practice manager working in a 2C practice and since starting with NHS Grampian I have battled with HR related to Chupi staff having a choice to move to NHS terms and conditions. We now have staff members who are employed by NHS Grampian and around 55% of staff who, who are Chupi. The challenge I face daily is that with the April uh, pay increase, I now have the majority of my admin team that are paid below a band one equivalent and nurses who are paid a whole grade below the NHS equivalent. Most staff members are long-standing experienced staff members and they feel undervalued. 
are asking staff to work to NHS Grampian job descriptions, asking them to wear NHS uniform, yet we're not willing to pay them fairly across the practice. I asked HR why they would not consider a choice and was told that it then makes the practice less attractive if the practice was to go out to tender. Other boards within Scotland taking on a 2C practice automatically offered to move to NHS terms and conditions. I thought NHS Scotland would want the same approach regardless of the region. Has this been discussed at government level and what is the government's stance on this? So thank you. A, a big, a big um, question, big conversation. Um, so I'll have a stab, but actually, um, li- happy to to have a have a con if, if this colleague is happy to speak to me and to get get the right person in touch because um, there's a couple of things in what you've said. So, firstly, irrespective of of the challenges that you've just described, um, I think it's really important that I say out loud the value that. Um, I place and and the whole system has to place on primary care without its contribution. Um, uh, where would we be? So, and that's all colleagues um, uh, that are working in in primary care. So, um, uh, uh, hugely value um, your contribution. And um, I'm sorry that, that that the unfairness, which is exactly how it'll feel for colleagues, because because that's potentially what it is. Um, I think that's very real. And, and I recognise that there's a huge amount of upheaval just now around primary care specifically. Um, in fact, there's a, a huge amount of upheaval at the moment. If we look at um, T's and C's, industrial um, relations, etc., I think I think there's just a, a growing tension in our workforce. So, so I acknowledge that. Um, uh, and then I would imagine, but don't know, that the rules by which we are bound will be set in statute and therefore um, things like tupi, um, eh, 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 but but that's not my area of expertise. So things like tupi and why we make the decisions we make um, will be based around the, the statutory, eh, so the legal frameworks that, that design those systems. And obviously you've got the GMS contract for primary care and and you've mentioned two C practices, so there'll be a level of technicality in this that, that I just don't know. However, my ears pricked up when you spoke about colleagues being paid less than a band one. I didn't think we had that anywhere in our system, and I don't think we should. And I recognise I am at risk of saying something that might um, not chime with some some um, policies or or however we've ended up where we've ended up. So I am going to think. How do we explore that further with you initially and then on a broader scale? So that's why I would welcome the conversation. So so um, uh, just drop me an email and let me know that it was you that asked the question. And um, then I will work out what we need to do. But um, particularly our strategic intent around being an anchor organisation, we should not be, be um, paying anybody under um, a gender for change band one. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Caroline. Like, like you, I was, I was particularly you know, struck by that, you know, that, that that aspect of the of the question. So, yeah, um, hopefully we'll you know get some clarity and um, you know influence or do what we can to make it um, you know uh, make it better. So, can um, I just double check how many questions we've got because my next meeting is about to start and I'm just going to see that I'm going to be a little bit late. So, yep. um, how many um, have we got? We've got, we've got two more questions left, which are both um, both relate to the dress policy. So, um, oh, good. I'm, I'm going to my next meeting then. I don't want to answer a question about the dress policy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'll answer the question. Just let me send the text. I can't, I can't speak and text. It's an age thing. Um, hold on. Oh, no, no, that's that's fine. And uh, proof of anyone needed that you know there's there's very little editing, uh, you know, that, that, that goes into these videos. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, sorry, the, the, the raw, the raw, the raw product. Right, carry on. I've done that. Okay. Um. So, uh, second last question. Then, is it possible to have a summer uniform? Uh, sorry, this is from an anonymous nursing colleague who works in ARI. Is it possible to have a summer uniform as to wear scrubs in the summer heat is too hot in the hospital? Every year, some nurses faint and it gets too hot, and summers are only getting hotter. Um, for identification, you know, we, you know, we 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 would wear our badges. Obviously, is this possible? So. 
this is not the first time we've been asked this question and um the 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 specific thing i can remember the last time was about shorts and i thought i had answered that but i obviously didn't so i i, I think i think we need to embrace the fact that um it, people will do the right thing and i know i've said this before um it was in relation to car parking <laughs> And I got a bit of pushback. But if we work from the working assumption that people will, will dress appropriately and, and what does that mean in this day and age and the amount of debate you could get into about that. And, and there will be gen, there will be um, generational differences in that. Um, um, so um, I think we need to do the right thing here. So we have an immediate issue and I know we have an immediate issue because colleagues today last week are experiencing extreme heat that is um, higher than than we would want to accept for working environments. So if there is anything that we can do to alleviate that for colleagues and make their working conditions more comfortable, we need to do that. I'm not going to fix that by the time we go through a, a process of changing a policy. So so Stephen, I'm going to suggest that between you and I as, as um, uh, uh, in the roles that we do, I see if there is anything specific that we can do here and now, and 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 I will take that through the exec team next week. Um, I don't know what that is. So, so one of the things, and you know, sometimes I think there's an easy answer and there's not. So, so I, I'm sure that last summer when I was asked this question, I was asked about shorts, and the 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 worry bead for me is that's fine if you can afford to go and buy yourself dress shorts. But if you can't, do I immediately create an inequity for colleagues? So I don't want to do that. So th there are there are people in the team that, that can advise me on that. But let's try and be pragmatic and do the right thing here and not get hung up on 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 difficult stuff. So I'm going to see if there is something with immediate effect we can do because of the weather um, and the fact that we can't ventilate particular environments adequately. Um, so we'll follow that up next week, um, and then I think there is a bigger thing that we um, we need to go back to the kind of what people are referencing around this, which would be the the, the I can't remember if it's a dress code guidance or policy or something. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. And yeah, you know, I'm I'm of course happy to um, you know play my part in you know in trying to develop solutions. You're particularly. Um, you know, given the current summer heat, um, uh, you know, in, a, in as timely a way as possible. Uh, I guess following on um, from that question, uh, so this this one's been submitted by an anonymous charge nurse, uh, which also relates to the dress policy. So the colleague says the current dress policy appears very outdated, not reflecting the changes in societal norms. The policy uh, talks about the fact that um, jewellery you know can be limited to two stud earrings. It doesn't state anything about facial piercings, which are uh, extremely common nowadays and do not necessarily interfere with patient care. Do you think it is maybe time that a new dress policy be written to include the diversity of the NHS? If facial and multi-ear piercings are to remain an issue, we may miss out on employing excellent staff members. Who is responsible for the dress uh, policy uh, as there's not currently a name on it? And I guess... Although that's that's the question of the anonymous colleague, I guess the dress policy is one of those that falls in the remit of GAPF. So, um, but I'll let you answer the, the wider questions, Carla. Yeah. So, do I think the policy needs to be reviewed? I think it probably does. Um, I, I recall having a quick look at it when this came up last year, and I remember thinking at that point, "Oh, we're going to need to go back and look at this." There's never going to be a written document that pleases everyone, so so let's not set that expectation. And um, we have a need to both meet the needs of the diversity of our working community and the the needs and expectations of the public. And therein lies the rub. So I think yes, the policy needs to be um, uh, updated. I think there's a normal time frame of five years for that, and I think this is meant to run to 25, but purely from a heat perspective and the, the changing conditions in our environment, um, I wonder if that could be a rationale for doing it earlier. I'll probably get a whole heap of flack for suggesting this. And um, you're right, it does sit under the Grand Pain Area Partnership Forum. 
um, and I will need to identify the right people to lead on this work. Um, it's always a contentious one, and and so let's try and get it right. Um, but but I think it is. It's a bit like water. Um, it's been raised so many times now um, in this session. It's clearly not just an individual issue. So um, let's get back around it and um, uh, uh, see what we can do. Thanks, Caroline. Okay, so that's the, the end of the questions for this month. Uh, I guess the next uh, episode of Ask Caroline will be out on the 13th of July. So please, can uh, your colleagues continue to send your questions in uh, as you know, in the usual way, and um, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, our audience uh, or you for our audience, uh, I'll be back uh, with a question and answer session with our executive nurse director June Brown, which I guess we kind of trailed last month. Oh, yeah. uh, so that so that'll be in the first week of July. Um, you know, so uh, hopefully that'll deal with some of the uh, nursing and the and AHP specific queries that we've received. So as always, this yeah. is very much a work in progress. So if you have any feedback or ideas, then please do get in touch with us. Yeah, great. And make sure you give June some tough questions. <laughs>